The next data structure we'll be talking about is the array list. If you're just joining in and haven't watched the previous episodes, you can click the link in the description below or the card in the top right corner, both of which will take you to the Introduction to Data Structures playlist which you can use to catch up. Now, an array list fundamentally can be thought of as a growing array. Previously, we talked about the array and how one of the main drawbacks to it was the fact that once it's initialized, an array's size could not be changed using conventional methods. Well, in contrast, an array list's size can expand as the programmer needs. If you take the array list on the screen now, full of four elements, and you decide to add one to it, it will simply expand its size to fit five elements. As you can probably tell, this is extremely useful, which begs the question of why not just always use array lists? I mean, in comparison, the array seems pretty trash. Well, that's definitely a valid question, and one which we will be getting to later in this segment. But before we can do that, we need to cover the basics of an array list, including the properties and the methods associated with it. Now, an array list is actually backed by an array in memory meaning that, internally, behind the scenes, the ArrayList data structure uses an array as its scaffolding system. This makes the ArrayList have a lot of similar functionality to an array. Now, this doesn't mean everything is going to be the same, which you will definitely see later on, but it's still important to make note of before we get too deep into things. Okay, so the next thing I want to do, before we talk functionality, is actually go over how to initialize an ArrayList. To do this, again, is going to vary based on which language you're using. So, shown on your screen now are two different ways to do so, Java and c -sharp. You may notice that there is no Python on the screen. And this is because the base version of Python, arrays and array lists are actually not separate entities. They are sort of Frankenstein together into a single data structure called lists. Lists take some functionality from arrays and some from array lists. It's a lot more complicated than that, but for this series, that's all you're going to need to know as to why we are not including Python. Now, going back to ArrayList initializations, another thing you might notice is that it looks a little bit awkward the way these statements are structured. And that's mainly due to the fact that the ArrayList is actually its own separate class, outside of the base version of these two languages. Now, I'm not going to get into class hierarchy and encapsulation and polymorphism right now because A, that's just not what this series is about, and B, those are very big words and they're scary. For right now, this just means that to create a new ArrayList, we have to involve the ArrayList class when creating it, which we can see is done at the beginning of both initializations. After that, you can see we give it a name and then set it equal to new ArrayList with a set of parentheses. Now, in these parentheses, you have a few options. You can either enter in an integer, which will then be used to define a size for the array list, or you can just leave it blank. Leaving the parentheses blank like that will automatically define the size of the array list as 10, just as sort of a base size. Again, remember, it can be increased dynamically as time goes on if we add enough elements to it. You may be wondering if we can actually populate the array list with elements when defining it, as we were able to do with arrays, but array lists actually do not support this type of declaration. So there you have it, creating array lists in different languages. This knowledge is going to come in handy later on, so hold on to that. Moving on, let's talk functionality. Now, an array list can be thought of as pretty much the evolved form of an array. It's a bit beefier, has a little bit more functionality, and is overall more powerful than an array. That's not to say it's going to be better in every case, but for the most part, it's going to be thought of as the favorite sibling amongst the two. This is mainly attributed to the fact that it belongs to the pre-built ArrayList class, which we talked about earlier. The fact that the ArrayList belongs to a class means it's going to come with some pre-built functions that are already at our disposal from the moment we define the ArrayList. More specifically, the ArrayList comes with methods we can use to access, change, add to, or delete from it easily. If you were using an array, you would have to program most, if not all, of these methods by hand. And so having them pre-built into the ArrayList class makes it especially useful. Now the type of functionality you're going to get, again, is going to vary based on language. For example, in Java, you'll have a variety of methods to use, including ones to add elements to the ArrayList, remove them, clear the ArrayList entirely, return the size of the data structure, etc., etc., as well as tons of other more specific functions. In C-sharp, you'll have some of the same methods as the Java ArrayList class, 
but you might also have some methods the Java version does not, and vice versa. The c -sharp version might not have some of the methods that the Java version does. The same is going to apply for any other language you use which might implement the ArrayList data structure. Because of the variability surrounding the ArrayList amongst languages, in this series at least, we're simply going to be covering six common methods that are both useful and can be found in most if not all versions of the ArrayList class. Those being the add method, the remove method, the get and set methods, the clear method, and the to array method. Now remember, all of these are pre-made for you, and so you don't have to program them by hand. All you have to do is simply call them on a pre-made array list and you are set to go. Speaking of pre-made array lists, before we dive into each of these functions and how they work, let's first create an array list we can use to manipulate using these methods to show how they work. Let's call it example and give it a size of four so that it's not preset to 10 and we're set to go. All right, let's begin with the add method. Now the add method actually comes in two different types, one which takes in only an object to add to the end of the array list, and one which takes in both an object to add to the array list, as well as an index value representing the index to insert the object add. Now the first one is for more basic cases, where you don't care about where in the array list the object that you're adding is going to go. It will simply append the element you pass in as an argument to the end of the array list. So let's take our example array list and run the add method on an integer of two. Now, uh, normally array lists only hold objects, not primitive types like the integer two that we're trying to pass in. However, the computer will automatically convert our primitive integer into an integer object with a value of two so that we can still add it easily without any problems. This is known as autoboxing and is going to be used throughout the rest of the episode to modify the array list with primitive types. So I thought I'd mention it now so that you're not confused later on. Okay, so when we run our code, since the array list is empty, it's going to add it at the first index, index zero. Now if we run another add method and this time pass in the integer five as an argument, since the zeroth index is already taken, it will be slotted in as the next available index, that being the first. Moving on to the second type of add method, one which takes in an object to add to the array list, as well as an index to add it to. This one works very similarly to the previous, only it makes sure the element you're adding is added at the index provided. So again, let's say now we wanted to add the number one, but we want to put it in so that it's in numerical order, so at the first index. What we would do is provide the index zero as an argument and the ArrayList will automatically shift our integers two and five over to the right one in order to make space for the new integer. This works for any index contained within the size of the ArrayList. So if we wanted to do it again, only this time insert the number three at the second index so that it remains in numerical order, we'd call example.add and then in the parentheses pass in the integer three and the index location two. After the code is run, you'll see that we have four integers in our ArrayList in numerical order. Now the next method that comes pre-packaged in the ArrayList class is the remove method. And this one also comes with two different types. The first takes in an integer as an argument and just as the name suggests, will remove the element at that index location. The second takes in an object and will remove the first instance of that object within the ArrayList. So if we wanted to remove the number five from our ArrayList, we'd have two different options. We can either call example.remove and inside the parentheses place the index of the value we want to remove, in this case three since it's at the third index, and the program will remove the object at index three. The other option would be to run another remove method, only this time pass in an integer object of five. It has to be an integer object in this case because if we were just to use five, the computer would try to remove the fifth index of the array list, which doesn't exist. By creating an integer object, we can ensure that when the code runs, the number five will be removed from the array list. Simple as that. Now, if there is no integer five in the array list, the remove method will simply not work and return negative one to let the user know. Now, I quite like the number five, so I'm actually not going to remove it from the array list just yet. Up next is the get method. Now, the get method is pretty much the same as referencing an index for an array. It takes in an index location and will return back to you the value at that location. So example.get with an argument of zero would return one, example.get with an argument of two would return three, and so on. 
The next method is the set method, and this is how we actually replace elements within the array list. Much like the name implies, it takes in an index and an object as arguments, and will set the element at the index which you passed in to the object you also passed in. So if we wanted to set the number five in our array list to be four, so that it matches nicely with the others, what we would do is call example.set, and within the parentheses, pass in the index location of the element we want to set, in this case three, and then also an integer we want to be placed in that location, in this case four. This call will override the element at position three to be four instead of five. Now, you should really be careful when you're using this method because you don't want to accidentally override an important element within your array list. Next up is the clear method, and this one is for when you just really dislike the contents of your array list. It's also perhaps the simplest of them all. It does not take in any arguments and simply clears the array list, deleting every element from within itself. Calling example.clear on our array list would just delete all the elements within it, but I just don't want to do that yet, so for the sake of this series, let's keep the array list filled with the values it currently has. Now the final method we'll be covering in this video is a little bit different than the rest, and that's the toArray method, which is used to convert an array list to an array. I thought I'd include this one because it's really useful and good to have on hand, especially for a series on data structures. The toArray method takes in no arguments and will simply convert the array list object to an array. Now for this to work, of course, you're going to need to set it equal to the creation of a new array like shown on your screen now. But when you do, you'll get a new array which contains all of the elements that were in the old array list. You may notice though that instead of an array of integers, it's an array of objects. This mostly has to do with that object-oriented programming stuff we talked about at the beginning, but for now it won't make too much of a difference. We can still treat it as an integer array, printing out indexes to the console, replacing elements within the array, typical array functionality, just the way that it's set up is different. So there they are, the six major functions that come with any given version of the ArrayList class. Having these at your disposal will account for much of the functionality you might use in ArrayList 4, making them extremely valuable. Let's now move on to the ArrayList as a data structure. Again, we're going to be looking at its four time complexity equations for accessing, searching, inserting, and deleting. Now if you remember back to the beginning of this segment, we mentioned that the ArrayList is backed by an array. And that means that, just like the array, it too will have O of 1 accessing power. This means that when we use our get method, it will return to us the value at the index provided in instantaneous time. Now, you may be wondering to yourself, how is this possible, since the data stored within an array list is not contiguous like the array was? Well, this is actually due to a really cool reason. So cool, in fact, that before scripting this segment, I actually had no idea that this was the case. So, because it's my series, I'm going to take a moment to talk about it. Now if we pull up our example array list in memory, you can see that it looks a little bit different than the array. Let's break down what's going on. Now, instead of storing the actual objects which are contained within itself, an array list actually stores references or pointers to the locations of those objects in memory. So the zeroth index based on the array list is stored at the 87th location in memory, which is currently storing the integer one. And if you remember back, that's actually what was stored in the zeroth index of the example array list. This goes for every element within the array. The first is stored at the 91st location, the second at the 100th, and so on. So while the actual data is not stored contiguously, the references to do that data are. And so when we run our get command, all it has to do is return the value stored at whatever index location points towards. It's a bit more complicated than that especially the way these references are stored, but that covers the gist of it. This is the reason that our ArrayList can have instantaneous accessing power without having the data stored contiguously. All right, that's enough sidetracking for today. Let's get back to big O notation. All right, so accessing is O of one and searching is going to be O of N. And this is for the same reason that arrays were O of N. If we want to find out if an object is contained within our ArrayList, and that object is at the last index, we're going to have to search through each and every element within the array list of size n just to make sure. Next up, inserting into the array list is going to be O of n, because worst case scenario, if we are inserting an element at the beginning of the array list, we need to do one of two things. 
either shift every element after the index we're inserting at to the right one, just like we needed to do for the array, or search through the whole list to find an open spot at the end. Either way you cut it, it'll end up being O of n. And deleting is O of n for the same reason. If we want to delete the first element within the array list, we then have to shift every element down one, or if we want to delete an object contained at the last index, we have to search through the whole list to find it. Again, O of n either way. All right, so there are four time complexity equations. Accessing is O of 1, and searching for, inserting, and deleting are all O of n. If that sounds kind of familiar, that's because these are the same as with the array. This is mainly, of course, due to the fact that the array list is backed by the array internally in storage, but this does bring up the question we asked at the beginning of the segment. Why even use an array in the first place? In comparison to the array list, the array just does not seem useful. Well, let's get into that by pitting these two data structures against each other in a game of compare and contrast. Okay, first up, an array is a collection with a fixed size, meaning it cannot be changed, whereas an array list has a dynamic size, which can be updated to fit the needs of the programmer. Arrays can store all types of data, whereas array lists can only store objects, meaning it cannot store primitives such as integers, strings, etc. Now, this problem is mostly solved through the autoboxing situation I talked about previously, but the fact still stands. Moving on, an array is built into most languages, meaning it doesn't have any methods for you to interact or modify it, whereas an array list is a class, meaning it comes with useful methods to help you utilize it, many of which we talked about today. Finally, an array is very primitive in nature and doesn't require a lot of memory or upkeep to use, whereas an array list is, again, a class, meaning it requires more space and time to use than an array will. Overall, hopefully you can see that while the array list is more powerful, it still does have some drawbacks which make using an array sometimes more appropriate. In general, you're going to want to use arrays for smaller tasks where you might not be interacting or changing the data that often, and array lists for more interactive programs where you'll be modifying the data quite a bit. So that's the array list, a dynamically increasing array which comes with a slew of methods to help work it. As always, if you feel that I haven't done a good enough job explaining some of the concepts in this video, the sources used to write the script for this video will be in the description below. But if not, let's move on to our next data structure, the stack. Thanks for making it to the end of the video. These videos can sometimes take quite a while to research, script out, and create visuals for, not to mention the audio recording and editing process. In total, these episodes can take up to 12 hours start to finish, so we appreciate you sticking around to the end. If you like this type of content and want it delivered to your subscription box free of charge, click the link on the right of your screen now to subscribe to the channel. As an added bonus, if you click the bell next to the subscribe button, we'll tell the big ups at YouTube to notify you when a new video is uploaded for no additional fee. And if you can't wait that long and are craving more of my melodic voice, you can click the playlist on the left of your screen now, which will take you to a playlist containing more programming fun. Until next time, peace.